Tonight on 16 by 9. Can I monish? No, Inside an ultra orthodox Jewish sect in Canada. People that join the community is because the community is what it is. Child protection workers allege abuse and neglect. We discovered houses that were dirty, uh, garbage all around, uh, some mattresses that were soaked in urine. Leaders say they are persecuted for religious beliefs. Child Protective Services decided to take our children. Investigating the true story behind the Lev Tahor veil. I know Lev Tahor, it's a cult. It's, 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 it's not true. It's not true. If you don't want to take the way that we teach here in the community, so bye-bye. Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. When the ultra-Orthodox Jewish sect called Lev Tahor fled Quebec for Ontario last November, it set off a firestorm of debate. The group says it left because of a conflict over religious beliefs and education rights. But child protection workers allege something more sinister is at play. The children are being abused and neglected. The controversy since then has only grown, and so we decided to travel to Lev Tahor's new community in Chatham, Kent, Ontario, where we were granted unprecedented access. For a week, we documented their culture and traditions. And tonight, in a full-hour special, we bring you this candid look at what Lev Tahor is all about. <laughs> In the Jewish faith, the most important ritual of all is the Sabbath, a day of rest and spiritual enrichment when all else is set aside. In the ultra-Orthodox community known as Lev Tahor, it is the one time during the week a wife forgoes her long black shador and emerges in pure white. It is she who lights the candles and opens her eyes to begin the holiday. Until nightfall on Saturday, all concerns drift away. When the Sabbath ended on November 17, 2013, there was no rest to be had. 35 families would travel on buses through the night from their home in Quebec to the quiet municipality of Chatham-Kent in far southwestern Ontario. The plan was meticulously laid out. Three buses, six cars, each person assigned a specific seat. The mood was very excited, very excited. After the past the border of Quebec. Everyone was cheering and started to sing, it's just singing, 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 singing. By mid-afternoon, the group of 200 ultra-Orthodox Jews had arrived in Chatham, a dozen bungalows behind the raised cornfields on the edge of town would be their new home. But what Lev Tahor was leaving behind in Quebec was more than empty houses. They were moving away from disturbing allegations that they were abusing and neglecting their children and living under extreme control at the hands of their grand rabbi, a convicted felon, Shlomo Helbrands. Child protection workers started investigating and were taking two families to court. But on Monday morning when they arrived for their final meeting, they found the community all but abandoned. Every family with children under 18 had fled. In court on Tuesday, a judge ruled the children in those two families, 14 in all, should be placed in immediate foster care. But by that point, they were gone. It's, 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 it's not true. It's not true. The leaders of this community deny the allegations of abuse and neglect. They say they left because of a conflict over education. Uriel Goldman. And they want to claim if you don't study our curriculum, you're not a good father. 
No, 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 no. We're going to apprehend your children because you need to learn about evolution, about homosexuality, about the curriculum that our professionals are preparing. Quebec wants to, to declare war against religion. It's their choice. To understand Lev Tahor, one must first understand that religion is the underpinning of everything here. It dictates the way people dress, they eat, they work. Yes, people will admit life here is strict, but to them, this is the purest form of Judaism, practiced to the letter of the Torah. If I believe this is the truth, I have to complete everything that's written there. It's common sense. Mayor Rosner is another community leader, and he, like most men here, wasn't allowed to make eye contact with me. One of the obligations is to go on exactly on the way that your parents was going. People say, listen, today it's different, it's very hard. We know it's very hard, but when we have a community, it's much easier. We show it to, the, to our brothers, the Jewish people, look, it's possible. And why should not do it the same way that we do it? Teaching that religion begins almost immediately. Boys begin school at three years old, learning the Yiddish alphabet. And this? At this age, there's still time carved out for play, but within two years, they'll start learning Genesis. <laughs> By their teenage years, class begins at 7.30 in the morning and continues until 9.30 at night. <laughs> the day spent poring over scripture and memorizing the Jewish laws. In Quebec, such a curriculum wouldn't be allowed. In Ontario, private schools operate independent of the government, but still have to teach core subjects like English, math, and science. We wanted to ask the older students what they were learning, but as a woman, I wasn't allowed in a classroom with young, impressionable men. Instead, our male cameraman was allowed to take a list of questions and ask them on our behalf. Hi, guys. How are you? And on the very first one... What ages are you? We were met with confusion. Thirteen? Fifteen. Fourteen. 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 Uh, do you know who the Prime Minister of Canada is? I knew. I knew I forget. I knew, now I forget. He's not meeting with him every day. Yeah, right. Do you know any of the provinces of Canada? Stefan. Stefan, oh, that's the Prime Minister? Uh, <laughs> what will you do for work when you're finished school? What do you want to be? We were told boys are taught an hour of English every day. But curiously, we couldn't find a single English textbook in the school. Their teacher, Michael Goldman. Does anybody here get a high school diploma? Between the other boys, I don't, I don't know. If someone here wanted to get a high school diploma, are they allowed? Yeah, you can. If, you want, if somebody wants it, it's, it's open. How it's, would they do that? I don't know. I can tell you. He will ask his parents to allow him to go to a school that he can do this diploma, if somebody really wants. So far, I don't think it happened. And thanks God that they accepting our education. OK, you can close your math books for now. For girls in Love to Whore, school is structured differently. Take out your spelling spirals. They are allowed more secular subjects with more hours of math and English. And now speak means to talk. In Yiddish, what will be the word? Reden. Reden. These students are 10 and 11 years old and eager to learn. So what does this say? Speak. Can you read the whole sentence for me? I will speak only Yiddish. If you could tell people in Canada about your experience living in this community, what would you want to tell people? I have a good rabbi. You have a good rabbi. make to to go the right way. And the right way. The rabbi teaches you to go the right way. Yeah, she might go. She my God is very happy. Your God is very happy. 
Classes have been put on hold for the past seven months since child protection workers started visiting many families in the community. Their teacher, Malka Rosner, says they've only recently resumed. We learned, try to learn practical things. So things that apply to your life is what you're yeah, studying. Yeah, a class of sewing, a class of cooking, um, what is important for your body, what vitamins. Um, we learn practical things. None of the teachers we met were accredited. Some only had the schooling they received here to pass on. So you are how old now? 13. Now she's 13. She, she has 13. her class from 13 to 15. So in about three years, you will become a teacher. In three years, you will become a teacher. Oh, yes. Will you like that, being a teacher? Yes, sure. To be fair, Lev Tahor isn't the only religious group that has clashed with Quebec's education laws. Still, its teachings are some of the most restrictive. Why are you opposed to teaching things like geography and Canadian history? I, I don't say I don't have to learn that. A lot of the religious studies is how you have to behave. And it's much more important. If I'm going to have extra time, I'm more than happy to learn all the other stuff. But Uriel, with respect, yes, we, we asked a group of 15, 16-year-old boys who the Prime Minister of Canada was, and nobody could give us his full name. Okay, this, this might be something, nothing personal, but it's, maybe it's talk about politics. Now, but this is the Prime Minister of the country. Okay, that's maybe a thing that they have to know, but we're not doing it uh, because we doesn't know, we doesn't want the children to know this fact. Absolutely not. According to the people of Lev Tahor, teaching their kids their way was grounds enough to leave their home in Quebec. On this, they could not compromise. But as we discovered in our week-long visit, the classroom is just the start to this extreme way of life. Next, a woman's place inside a Lev Tahor home. It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah that women have to wear black. A woman has to be modest. Before all else in Lev Tahor, the day begins with prayer. The blend of voices, young and old, can be heard from outside, surging from a near whisper to a fervent chant. This is also the time men don the tefillin, binding scripture to the head and the heart. In most ultra-Orthodox communities, this morning worship lasts about 45 minutes. In Lev Tahor, it goes on for two hours. Once the day is underway, there is much business to be done. But how this community makes money is less than conventional. Joseph Bibi, for example, is a kindergarten teacher. As a teacher, you are paid? No, not at all. And so how do you get money to live? Live food. Uh, we, we send me food. Then. As we discovered, the person who most often pays for food and rent is one of the community leaders, like Mayor Rosner. I'm one of them. Yes. And the money for rent and food comes largely from donations, written out to Lev Dehor's registered charity. Who are these people who are making the donations? Ah, it's not, uh, I cannot say, in, uh, it's not people that would like to mention their names. Are they in Canada? Some in Canada, some in the United States, some in London, and some in Israel even. Those donations aren't small. Lev Tahor's first charity, Congregation Riminov, was worth over $5 million before it lost its charitable status. Its current charity, the Society of Spiritual Development, has also seen millions flow through its accounts. Despite that, Lev Tahor has left behind in Quebec thousands of dollars worth of bounced checks, unpaid taxes, and unsettled bills. While we were told a few men do work outside the community, we didn't expect to find anyone like Avraham Dinkel. 
wondering, uh, do you have any prices on the rice for, uh, for North Africa? Avraham is a commodities trader from Toronto and the newest member of Lev Tahor. But because of her, of her close uh, connections in, in uh, Vietnam, I, I was thinking that maybe she can just get a spot price. Or a As a principal, access to the internet, TV and the radio is forbidden. But when it serves the community, be it for legal matters, monitoring media reports or generating revenue, some people are granted special permission. How is business for you living in this community? It's great, it's great, it's great because I'm, I'm able to balance religion and, and business on a, in a very, very healthy manner. And the money you bring in, does that money go to helping the entire community or do you keep that just for your family? Well, it goes to my bank account because <laughs> it's my money. But uh, I would definitely give back to the community and help them out. The other source of revenue in this community is the government. A family with 10 kids, which isn't uncommon, receives upwards of $35,000 a year in child tax benefits. Hi, sir. But raising those families falls to the women. And as we quickly learned, Liba Goldman, Malka Rosner, and Sarah Helbrands are very busy. How many children do you have? Eight. Nine. Thirteen. The families here are made up of Canadians, Americans, and Israelis, and they start early. Some of the American girls were married in the U.S., where it's legal at 15. In Canada, a girl must be at least 16 for it to be legal. How old were you when you got married? 16 and a half. I was 19. I was married before I came to the community. Yeah, I was a little over 16. One of the allegations against Love to Whore is that girls in Canada are married under 16. There were a lot of false allegations on our community because people had, there were girls that had babies before the 17. There was one that uh, married exactly by the 16. <laughs> My 13 year old daughter, if she wants to get married, she wants to be a mother. If their career in life is to be a mother, so they want to start their career already. There must be some girls who say, I'm not ready yet. There must be. There is girls that even the parents feel that their kids are not ready by the 16. And then what happens? We wait. Once they are mothers, many hours will be spent in the kitchen. But the rules when it comes to cooking in Lev Tahor reach far beyond the kosher norm. Do you eat rice? Rice, no. It has problems with worms. Worms? Yes. Chicken and chicken eggs are forbidden. All vegetables, unless organic, must be peeled. Even a tomato? You would peel a tomato? Yes. Of course, the most distinctive feature of the women in Lev Tahor is their long black shador. It isn't something they've always worn. Not too many years ago, they used to wear skirts and color. Whose decision was this? Ours. This is woman. Ours. But it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah that women have to wear black. A woman has to be modest, so, so. if you think about it, <laughs> Mattis is not red or yellow or striky or tight. All of the shadors the women make themselves. But while we were visiting, they were sewing something new, a sleep sack. Okay, so this is basically all done, you see? It's a design they came up with after child protection workers reported girls with fungus on their feet from leaving their stockings on, even in bed. We want to sleep with our feet covered to be modest and covered and especially next to the man. Even your husband? Even the husband. Your husband can't see your feet? I won't be comfortable, you should see my feet. <laughs> to what extent can someone in this community be an individual? Sure, they could be an individual. But everybody is happy with the same way, so there's no need to be different. People that join the community is because the community is what it is, and that's why they are here. So why should people try to be different? Has your daughter ever said to you, Dad, I want to wear short sleeves today? Never, because uh, I must say God, God blessed me with very good children. But beneath the veil of life in Lev Tahor, youth protection workers say there is something more sinister at play. Disturbing allegations of underage marriage, filthy living conditions, 
and extreme control. Next, allegations by outsiders. I know Left Tower, it's a cult. It's a hell. It's a hell. August 6th, 2013. The day the community calls the raid. 21 youth protection workers arrive in St. Agath and start knocking on doors. Dennis Barabee and his team received a tip from Interpol that children were being abused. We discovered houses that were in, in the state uh, of, of dirty uh, garbage all around. Uh, children, they slept four or five in, in each bedroom. Some mattresses that were full of, of uh, urine. They were... Mattresses soaked in urine. Mattresses soaked in urine. Nurses were brought in and found some children were underweight. Others had fungus on their feet. Almost all of the children. And, and that's why there is the hygiene problem in that community. I read reports that some children's feet were black with fungus. Is that yeah. true? Why was the fungus so bad? It's because they did not... Uh, properly take care of their body, you know, uh, they would not shower or take a bath uh, on a regular basis. And the women were fully dressed from, uh, you know, top to bottom, and they would not remove uh, this when they would go to bed. Barabee's team opened files on 128 children and came back again the next week. The deeper they looked, the more unsettling their findings. If a parent wasn't doing the, what he had to do in the community or wasn't following his leaders, then, you know, children would be taken away and placed somewhere else. It was punishment? It was punishment to the parents. So somebody in that community had control? The leaders, it's, it's, that's very clear. Who's the leader? Well, you have the rabbi. And you also have three other individuals, which are Mr. Uh, Nachman Elbran, Mr. Uriel Goldman, and Mr. Mayor Rosner. Education was a concern for Barabee's team, but it went far beyond that. The children were so isolated, he said, there was evidence they hadn't even ventured outside their own street. We had a child that uh, was five years old on the 6th of August when we took him out of the community to bring him to our offices. The child was amazed to see that there was traffic light and that light could change. He had never seen a traffic He'd light. He had never seen a traffic light. <laughs> and yet things at their new home in Ontario appear to be different. We saw many things that were happening, like children playing with cars and things like this wasn't happening before. So what do you mean? So we saw children playing with toys. They didn't have toys before? Not really. When we went into the house, we almost never saw toys. But they kind of made a big show to the media. So you think we're being played? Everybody has been played in a way. None of it fools Esther Katso Varsili. I know Lev Tower, it's a cult. Her daughter Maggie left Israel to join Lev Tahor three years ago. They were incredibly close. Today, they no longer speak. <laughs> Through her daughter's friend, she's heard of how the rules in Lev Tahor have to be obeyed. How even her four-year-old grandchild would tell on his mother for listening to music. Twice Esther visited Maggie in Quebec. On the last trip, her daughter kicked her out. Esther is the only one who's been cut off. 16 by 9 spoke with many former members who say once you leave, there is no going back. 
So if your daughter decides that she doesn't want to believe in your beliefs anymore, would you still speak with her? Um, I will speak with her, but not, not, not as much as, as I was speaking before. Would you invite her to your house for Shabbat? No. There is an obligation to protest if somebody uh, doesn't follow anymore the religious. Not, not to bring her into my house and to show to my Jewish children that this is an option. It's sad to say, but it's going to be a big conflict. Those who have left say they had to go, that the people of Lev Tahor are brainwashed, and that the men there are Rabbi Helbrin's soldiers. They speak of beatings, emotional abuse, and their fear is still so crippling, they refuse to go on camera. Information in police search warrants goes even further. It lists psychological control through medication, underage girls married off to men twice their age, and beatings with crowbars and belts. None of the allegations have been proven in court, but police continue to investigate. It's why Esther is trying to get her family out. She's testified at hearings being held into Lev Tahor at the Knesset, and she's reached out to other families who share her struggle. Still, that doesn't ease the fear she has for her grandchildren. Lev Tahor, she says, is no place for a childhood. It's a hell. It's a hell. One word, it's a hell. Next, the rules, regulations, and questionable past of the rabbi at the top. Is it true you've burned the Israeli flag? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. In a matter of months, Lev Tahor has become a fight between two versions of the truth. Those who live here call it a euphoric place where people practice the ultimate form of Judaism. Those outside paint a painful picture of brainwashing, abuse, and neglect. One thing is clear, however, Lev Tahor as we know it wouldn't exist were it not for one man, the man at the top, Grand Rabbi Shlomo Helbrands. We would meet with him in Lev Tahor's former home in saint agathe mont Quebec, for what would be one of the most unusual interviews ever. With all your soul. For seven hours we talked. He made us read scripture and showered us with food. He was charismatic. And one, and two, and one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> oh, I feel so great. Yeah. I'm a star. And he told us no topic was off limits. People talk about control in this community. They say that you have ultimate control. Do you? <sighs> no, I have not ultimate control. Some people have said that if they want to buy a book, they have to ask your permission. Yes, you're not allowed to, 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 to buy and to read any book. Absolutely not. So if somebody wanted to read a beautiful book by Margaret Atwood during the week. So I will, I will, I will take, tell to them that the Jewish law is that they're not allowed to do it. But if we will know of somebody that always you read literature that we are not allowed, we will ask him not to be a part of our community. While the rabbi also claims his followers left Quebec because of the conflict over education, he admits they executed their emergency escape plan out of fear. You moved to Ontario because you were fearful that the government was going to take your children. We were convinced 100 percent that the Child Protective Services decided to take our children. Since that departure, only those without children have remained in Quebec. There were about 250 people who lived here. Yes. And today, fewer than 10. <laughs> yes. The new school they had built sits empty. Their synagogue, where daily worship and weddings were held, a vacant reminder of what once was. 
So the women were in this room and the men prayed in that room. Yes, yes. You, you can't see very much when you look through these holes. No, they're, they're coming to pray, not to, not, to, not, to, not to see. The story of how the community settled here in a quaint Catholic town is just as curious as the reason they left. It traces back to Rabbi Helbrin's roots in Jerusalem. An only child of secular parents, Helbrin's was drawn to religion as a teen. By the mid-80s, he was giving lectures in a rented apartment, and Lev Tahor was born. One of the defining pillars of his teaching is anti-Zionism, that Israel should not belong to the Jews until the Messiah comes. You cannot be a Jew with agree with Zionism. In my eyes, was the Zionist state committed to the Jewish nation is thousands times worse than the Holocaust in Europe. The state of Israel is worse than the Holocaust. The culturally, the culturally Holocaust, the culturally spiritually Holocaust. You must know that what you're saying is going to infuriate thousands, if not millions, of Jews. And this is the reason that we're sitting right now about all these stories. They're working against us. They hate us. They want to kill us. So, yes, I say it again, and I would like to say it publicly. The Nazis committed a terrible Holocaust physically to the bodies. Zionism committed a terribly spiritually Holocaust to the souls, to the real existence from the Jewish nation, to the real existence from the Jew. Is it true you've burned the Israeli flag? Yes, of course, yes, yes. It's one thing to be opposed to the state of Israel. It's another thing to burn the flag. Why, Why? did you have to go to such extremes? Because the idea from Zionism brand the Torah publicly to all of the world. In Lev Tahor, Hebrew, the Zionist language as he calls it, is shunned. His people can speak only Yiddish. The number of Rabbi Helbrin's followers grew in the 90s when he moved to upstate New York. There he lived relatively unnoticed. That is until the rabbi made headlines. 1992, and Rabbi Helbrins was charged with kidnapping a 13-year-old boy who came to study with him for his bar mitzvah. The trial drew hundreds from the Hasidic community who decried the charges. But Helbrins would be found guilty. It's a sad day for the history of the United States that this could happen, that a man has been sentenced for helping an abused child. His sentence, four to 12 years in jail. After only two years in prison, the rabbi was released. He was deported and came to Canada. He applied for refugee status on the grounds he would be persecuted in Israel, and he got it. You thought if you went back to Israel, you would be killed. Is that what you're saying? I have no doubt that no everybody that belonged to left our community will be killed in the end instead of Israel. I mean to say, in the few weeks that I was there before I came to Canada, I became beating and go to the hospital at least, at least 30 times. In saint agathe de mont north of Montreal, Lev Tahor built a new home. To anyone who wanted to follow their way of life, the doors were open. But to anyone who didn't, the punishment was made clear. If you don't want to take the way that we teach here in the community, so bye-bye, go out to the community. This is the only punishment that we can to share with somebody. Yes. Did you kick them out? Yes, of course. My, my, my younger daughter from, from 16 years um, left our community. She didn't want to dress the way the women here dress? Yes, she doesn't want to, and I, I respect it very well. What's, uh, what's, uh, what am I supposed to do? I, uh, what am I supposed to do if you don't want you to? You didn't want to say to your daughter, OK, you can wear jeans? No, absolutely not, no, absolutely not. This is not a community from jeans wearings. A point. If you want to wear jeans, you can't wear jeans. Not in, my, not in my community, not in this community. The community also has rules about marriage. Matches are arranged, and it's startlingly young ages. I have not nothing against marriage under 16. Under 16, I think the other circumstances, it's, it's, it's good that they will, will marry, yes. So I was learning that the law from Quebec is not to let children under 16 to marriage. So we take care careful very much not to marry people under 16 because we want to respect the, the law from, from, from Canada. 
Ultra Orthodox communities, uh, yeah, basically the girls get married around 18. Uh, 15 and 16 is understood to be uh, 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 way too young. To put what we witnessed in Love to Whore into perspective, we enlisted the expertise of another rabbi, Orthodox Rabbi Reuben Pupko. This is a community that is born out of the general Hasidic community, but has moved in significant ways to the extreme. But who are they modeling themselves after today? They're modeling themselves after the most extreme Muslims, in a way, in how they dress and how they treat women. I mean, that's the bizarre part. The way the women dress in Leif Tar has no parallel in any Jewish community today or ever. They would say this is the way Jewish women used to dress 200 years it's ago. It's a lie. The people in this group, as religious as they are today, and w if, their, if their great grandparents came back to life and visited them, would not recognize them. How about this notion of having the feet covered at all times? Is a husband allowed to see his wife's feet? Yes. So why would you need a sleep sack? I have no idea. The women who I spoke with who were adults there said, we are here freely. We are here because we want to be here. Huh. Nobody forced me to get married. I'm very happy. Huh. I'm living a great life. So but what? But it's very comforting to be in a cult. All questions are answered, all decisions are handed over, and you have this uh, exalted vision of your own destiny and of your, of your, and how beloved you are in the eyes of God and how authentic you are. It's a very comforting bubble to live in, but it's not real, and it's certainly not authentically Jewish. It's one of the reasons youth protection workers are trying to get more than a dozen children out, why the fight for their custody has now been taken to court. But will a new province mean they are beyond reach. Next, a community caught in a battle between law and religion. All the allegations against us are false. It has to be with the fact that we have a Jewish religious group. For 10 years, the people of Lev Tahor lived relatively undisturbed. They practiced their religion, they prayed for the coming of the Messiah, and were left alone. Today, for sale signs are posted outside their former homes, cameras have been installed in the street, and visits from children's services are a regular occurrence. What's it been like living in this community for the last two months? Mm. The main thing is what we experience is the big pressure of the CAS, which... Um, social workers. The social workers, the child protection of uh, Chatham. My nine-year-old son, he's sometimes night-talking, and I heard him screaming, they're here, they're here. Yeah, I had that with my uh, six-year-old, the same thing. He woke up at night, the bad people are here. The bad people the are? The bad people, that the child protection, protective people. I could only assume that child protection would say that they are here to look after the well-being of the children and to help. They say they have some concerns, but I ask them, excuse me, you visited my home many times and you didn't find anything. So you want, you're coming that you want to find something? Tell me, what do you want to find? For the people here, the hope was that the impromptu visits and the media glare would end on February 3rd. It was the day an Ontario judge would rule whether the Quebec order to apprehend the children of two families would stand. It was one of the most crucial decisions this community has ever faced. At 3 p.m., the women gathered to pray. But in just over an hour, the verdict they were dreading. Ah! I don't believe it. Ah! The Ontario court agreed with Quebec that the children needed to be apprehended. It can't be. It doesn't make sense. I'm very sad. I can't believe it. The community is appealing and insists its case is strong. Uh, we do claim again and again all the allegations against us are false. I, we do think this arrestment out there, it's have to be with the fact that we have a Jewish religious group. 
the possible implication of this ruling that more children could be taken isn't lost on the people here. This means everyone, you know. What do you mean? It means everyone. Dennis Barabee is with Quebec's Youth Protection. These children represent two files of 15 that you have. Yeah. So what happens to the 100 other children that you are investigating? We're going to hope that my colleagues in Ontario will be able to uh, kind of move forward with these families. It could be that 100 other children could be apprehended also. That will be up to the Ontario services to decide what they do with that. Jewish foster families in Quebec have been readied. Children's Services knows this case is particularly delicate. What is your reaction to being called a cult? Oh, it's, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. You know what the really thing is? Why are you so loyal to your God? And this is really disturb people. This was is all about. If you take it as a hobby, that's fine. But if you're really loyal and mean it seriously, then you are cult. As for the man at the top. If the judge rules such a terrible thing, what's supposed to be our, my, my reaction after me? <laughs> it's a, it, I, I say this question, not, not as a rhetorical question. What, what really do we have to do? I ask you what we have to do. The grand rabbi allowed his people to flee once. It's possible, he says, they may have to again. The truth is that if you'll be allowed, if no place in Canada, it's possible for, for us to fulfill our religious laws and obligation, we'll try to, 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 to look in other places. We, our forefathers did many times in the history. Rabbi Helbrin's left Quebec last month and is now with the rest of his followers in Ontario. As for the community's legal fight, they're back in a Chatham courtroom this Tuesday asking for a stay of the order to remove 13 children. We'll be right back. Coming up next week on 16 by 9, Canada slaughters tens of thousands of horses for their meat every year. But that meat could be laced with deadly drugs. And critics say federal regulators are ignoring the danger. From the auctions right through to the, to the slaughter plant, nobody is breeding these horses thinking that they're going to head to slaughter. Silky Shark was a horse that had a lot of drugs. Yes. There is a long list of drugs that are banned from entering the human food chain. The majority of it clearly states right on it, not to be used on horses intended for human consumption. Is there any way that that horse should be in the food supply? Uh, if I was a consumer of horse meat, I'd say certainly not. 99.9% of all horses have been on these substances at some point in their life. Is it possible for somebody to try and evade the system? Yes. But if somebody does something wrong here, somebody can die. Possibly, yes. If you tell the truth, you can't sell the horse, you can't make a profit. That's right, that's the, the current system that's in place now. It says that anything goes, for sure. It would take somebody to die before they will pay attention. That's what it's going to take. We hope you'll join us for that story next week. In the meantime, that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.